Good morning. I'm Robert Spoo, Chapman Professor here at the Law College, and I want to welcome all of you, friends and colleagues, to the 22nd Buck Colbert Franklin Lecture, one of our very prestigious lectures uh, that we, we have each year. Uh, I'll leave it to others to tell you how extraordinarily appropriate it is that we have Franklin here today as our Buck Colbert Franklin speaker. But I want to welcome you, and my task is the pleasurable and limited one of introducing our president of TU, Brad Carson. You do the great Native American writer Angie Debo in her book on Tulsa, begins it with a very eloquent passage saying that Oklahoma has a complicated history that in some ways is reflective of the entire United States. And she meant that both as a criticism and a compliment with here the Native American, the African American, the white settlement tradition, the exploitation of energy, both for wealth and for despoliation. And it is a complicated history, and we are here today to talk more about that history. And it's one that we are trying to build upon here at the university in exploring academically. We do have an amazing African-American tradition here in Oklahoma, of course, one written about by people like um, Toni Morrison, many others, produced great intellectuals like um, Ralph Ellison, Cornell West, and of course, several generations of the Franklin family. So I want to welcome you here tonight and this afternoon for our homecoming weekend for a terrific lecture by someone who is one of the most distinguished Oklahomans, and to have him back here today to talk about his own experiences, his own vision, his own academic work is really a pleasure for all of us. So thank you all for coming. Uh, Dean Oren Griffin is going to do a more formal introduction, but Dr. good to see you again being here. And Oren, I'll turn it over to you for the task of a more formal introduction, but I just wanted to say thank you all for being part of this great event. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, good morning. Thank you, President Carson. This is a a wonderful day uh, for the law school and a wonderful day for our university. I want to thank all of you for being here. First of all, we're so happy to see our students here, so many alums, friends of the law school. Uh, it's a tremendous time, so welcome. Uh, it's a special weekend, it's homecoming weekend, and while we are uh, excited about that, we are certainly poised that we will get a victory tomorrow on the football field against <laughs> SMU. So. We are cheering for our young men and uh, all those who will be working tomorrow for a victory. It's also an important time for us at TU Law because what we begin at this event, to begin the celebration of 100 years where this law school has been in action, educating students, preparing the next generation of lawyers. This law school for the last 100 years has grown and changed, but it has always been a contributor so we are excited about the 100-year celebration, and we're so happy to have a wonderful guest here to talk about history and to talk about what the institution can provide. Um, we've had a great couple of months, and back in May, we had Vanessa Adams Harris here to speak about the work that she has done in reconciliation and social justice um, from the John o. Franklin Center of Reconciliation. Uh, after that, we had Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton the chief judge for the Sixth Circuit for the United States Courts of Appeals was here to speak about the court and the, the rule of law and the challenges to the federal court and the questions that we have about the rule of law given the current times. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were fortunate to have Michael Fitzpatrick from the Wisconsin Court of Appeals to talk about the issue of judges and juries and what young lawyers need to know about practicing law and what they need to avoid as they begin to try to work in their careers later on dealing with the complexity of, of juries and how the, the, the human condition and what person may react to uh, uh, in the interest of their client needs to be carefully considered. So it's been a great couple of, of, couple of weeks, couple of months for us in terms of the kind of speakers we, we brought forward. And today we're so happy to have John Whittington Franklin and his wife Karen, and who I'm gonna ask to stand and just be acknowledged here today. <laughs> If you spend any time with John, you realize that behind a great man is a greater woman, and he's tell it, that tell it. <laughs> it's important to recognize that the Franklin family has been very generous to the University of Tulsa and the College of Law by lending the name of John's grandfather, B.C. Franklin, to the clinic. The clinic, we think, uh, does 
more than simply provide our students important educational experiences. We think the clinic provides the kinds of legal experiences that B.C. Franklin would have been proud of, the kind of things that he pursued in his career. And so we are happy for the Franklin family to be here, but we are also very grateful. John himself is a distinguished speaker. Many of us are familiar with his work. 50 years, his life and career involves issues regarding cultural and educational uh, matters, especially when it comes to studies regarding the transatlantic uh, slave trade, colonization of areas regarding French-speaking uh, countries and areas of the world. John has been a leader in this area. He's also a senior manager emeritus for the Smithsonian. He's also been intimately involved with the Nassau Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. He also has served as chairman of the Maryland Commission of African American History and Culture, and has been involved in the expansion of museums all across the state of Maryland and in other parts of the world, and has been a real champion for asking the tough questions on those issues that involve race and culture. John is also intimately familiar with Tulsa. He's intimately familiar with Tulsa and its struggles with regards to issues of race and culture, and today I think we will hear from him on those issues. Perhaps one thing that I find most impressive is that he and his father, uh, the late John Hope Franklin, edited a book, completing the book of his great-grandfather, My Life in an Era. <laughs> I would invite you, if you haven't read the book, to add it to your collection. The book provides an autobiography of B.C. Franklin, but it also shows the relationship, the important relationship between family members, between son and father, and the work that they perform. It's a wonderful read and a wonderful contribution to what we know about our home here in Tulsa. Before I turn over the podium to, to John, I want to also acknowledge a very important person that made this day possible. Certainly, we have a tremendous leader in Brad Carson who has made diversity and inclusion a priority. It's very important to my decision to accept the position and join this wonderful law school. But I also want to recognize Lynn Inzeroff, the former dean of our law school. Lynn, where are you? Can you stand, please? There she is. Hey, Lynn. At a law school and an academic institution, we understand that collegiality is extraordinarily important. Lynn has been a visionary for this law school, and she's returned to the faculty. And she now works with our students, and she teaches and pursues her scholarship. But Lynn had the vision many years ago that this clinic could be an important resource for Tulsa, an important resource for the university. And so while I stand here as the dean of this law school in time, I understand that this is a position of stewardship. And during my time, I will work hard to support our law school and to bring wonderful speakers and intellectuals to the campus. But that is nothing new. And so for Lynn and my other colleagues, members of the faculty, members of our clinical faculty, I am grateful for the work that you have done. For our alums and those of you who have been supporters of the school, we ask you to stand with us. We have much more work to do. This cannot be simply a discussion of history. It has to be a discussion of the future. It has to be a discussion of empowerment. And so today, we have a wonderful speaker. Join me in welcoming John Whittington Franklin to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jerry Dilling, if you can join us as juror number three, please. There's seats here. <laughs> Jerry's older brother was my first director at the Smithsonian. They're from Yale, Oklahoma. There are only, it's only half a degree of separation in our world. Thank you, President Carson. Thank you, Oren, for that kind introduction and the opportunity to give the 22nd Buck Colbert Franklin Lecture here at the TU School of Law. You may or may not know that my father gave the first lecture in 2000. So it's walking in his footsteps, walking in my grandfather's footsteps. And as I walk through Tulsa, I'm walking where they used to walk. So it's very exciting. This lecture is dedicated to both my paternal grandfather, Buck Colbert, or B.C. Franklin, as he was known, and my paternal grandmother, Molly Parker Franklin. They established the home where my father and his siblings learned their values 
including those of public service. In today's lecture, you will learn about the larger context of slavery in the Western Hemisphere in which the United States developed. You will hear about the harsh laws African Americans were subjected to in colonial times before the United States laws were formulated. Slavery and Jim Crow era of segregation shaped attitudes and customs toward African Americans in every region of the country. It is into that world that attorney B.C. Franklin was born. If you could look here at the first slide. When the Portuguese began exploring the West African coast at the beginning of the 15th century, the question was, are these Africans humans? Do they go to the same heaven or hell? The Portuguese continued down the coast to the Cape of Good Hope and up the east coast of the continent. They captured Africans from west coast near the present day Senegal and took them to the Cape Verde Islands. These African men and women were forced to grow oranges, bananas, and sugarcane newly imported from India. The Portuguese established the first slave-based plantations. When the African men were harnessed to, mill, to, to a mill to crush the sugarcane harvest, they rebelled, saying they were not beasts of burdens, and escaped the plantations and formed the first free villages in the mountains of Santiago. When Europeans crossed the Atlantic, the same question was asked, were these Indians human? Did they have souls? This map was created by Dr. Joseph Harris, who in the early 1950s studied history at Howard University with my father, John Hope Franklin. Professor Harris, who created this map for classroom use in 1990, is considered one of the fathers of the African diaspora. The Indian Ocean slave trade goes back to before the Common Era, but an estimated 7 million were taken between the 7th century and 1920. The trade in humans across the Sahara to the Mediterranean is estimated at 9 million. We are mostly familiar with the transatlantic slave trade, which begins in the early 1500s by the Spanish, Dutch, and Portuguese followed by the Danes, French, British, and Americans. The majority of Africans are taken to the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. Note that Africans are brought from East Africa to the West, and that Africans are walked across the Panama Isthmus to ships waiting to take them down the West Coast of South America to Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile. But how many people were brought in chains to the Americas? The ship captains kept meticulous records of their merchandise, human and other cargo. European ships were built to hold cargo of guns and ammunition, knives, wine, liquor, china, porcelain, textiles and clothing, iron, pots and pans, and glassware. In this slide, you see how many voyages were undertaken by different European cities. Liverpool the most with 5,000, London and Bristol with over 2,000, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal are all involved in the trade. The goods that they produced were warehoused in fortresses the Africans built on the West African coast and were traded for humans. Often baptized in chapels in these forts, men and women were loaded onto floating prisons and taken to the Americas. The first, visit, the first fortress I visited was Christianborg Castle, built in Ghana by the Danes in the 1660s. The ships returned to Europe and their investors full of timber, sugar, rum, cotton, indigo, and gold. These next maps show the numbers taken from East and West Africa, as well as those taken across the Sahara. Fewer than 500,000 of the 12.5 million brought to the Americas, fewer than 500,000 are brought to what is now the United States, only 5%. A million each to Jamaica, Haiti, and Cuba, 6 million to Brazil, 4 million down the coast of West, west Coast of South America. Remember that slavery is the separation of families, 
kidnapping, rape, torture, murder, forced labor, and the selling of children. Imagine the physical and psychological toll of removing 12.5 million young people from the African continent. Girls between 12 and 18, boys between 14 and 20. The economies of the Americas, rural and urban, benefited from three full centuries of free labor. We have just observed the second national Juneteenth, the date when the last US slaves were freed in 1865 in neighboring Texas. What was the first state to free its slaves? Vermont in 1777. Pennsylvania followed in 1780 with the concept of gradual emancipation. If you were a girl, you would not become free until you were 18. If you were a boy, not until you were 21. New Hampshire and Massachusetts follow in 1783. Rhode Island and Connecticut in 1784. New Jersey in 1804. New York in 1827. All of these states had had slavery since the 1620s. Now in these this is showing the inset of all the imports into the Caribbean. And look, you think of West Africa from Nigeria to Senegal, but look how many are being brought from Central Africa, from Congo, Angola. In these next two slides, you'll see how the United States emancipations fit in the hemisphere. Haiti is the first to free its slaves in 1793. Much of Central America frees its slaves in the 1820s. Britain abolishes slavery in all of its colonies in 1833 from Canada. Yes, Canada had two centuries of slavery to Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. France frees its slaves twice after the French Revolution, and then Napoleon reinstates slavery. His first wife is a sugar planter in Martinique, Empress Josephine. And, rein and reinstate slavery in 1802 to 1848. South American slaves are freed between the 1820s and 1850s. The Netherlands frees its slaves in 1863. And the last two in the hemisphere are Cuba in 1886 and Brazil in 1888. Do attitudes about slavery and people of African descent follow these immigrants to the United States? Look at Los Angeles this month. Attitudes and laws about enslaved Africans in the United States begin in the Dutch, Spanish, English, and French colonial regions. In 1630, a white man is whipped for sleeping with a black woman. In 1640, a black woman is whipped for sleeping with a white man and be becoming pregnant. In 1643, the Virginia Assembly determines that black women are taxable at 16 years of age, not white women or native women. It lists all of their work in the field, house, and sexual labor. In 1654, it is determined that unlike white indentured servants, black slaves are slaves for life. In 1659, the product of an English father and an enslaved mother is sold and fights successfully for her freedom. But the law is changed so that the child of an enslaved woman remains in bondage regardless of the paternity. In 1667, Virginia law on baptism determines that Christianity will not free you from slavery. People were trying to become Christian thinking they could no longer be slaves. Change the law. Virginia law forbade African before forbade slip, excuse me. Virginia law forbade them from bearing arms. In 1685, France promulgates the Code Noir, the Black Code and all of its colonies in Africa, the Caribbean, and eventually Louisiana. You are furniture, its states of slaves. Barbados is where the French, the first British slave codes are established and influence Virginia's laws. The Virginia codes of 1705 concerning servants and slaves had 41 sections and 4,000 words. It included that if by correction a slave dies, it will not be considered a felony. In New York in 1712, two dozen slaves revolt, revolt, resulting in new laws. 
no more than three can congregate. Slaveholders could punish up to killing. Slave could be whipped 40 lashes. Plotters could be tortured and killed. 23 were hung, roasted, broken on the wheel until dead. Following the second revolt in 1744, new laws were enacted in New York against free blacks. Education for blacks free and enslaved was illegal in many places. In the 1830s, a school for girls in Connecticut was destroyed by the fathers when the schoolmistress refused to send away a black girl. All of our earliest universities are slave-based institutions, from Harvard in 1636 to Yale in 1701. Presidents, faculty, and students owned slaves. UVA owned 4,800 slaves. The University of Alabama purchased women slaves as prostitutes for the students. The first nine presidents of Princeton owned slaves. Medical schools used black bodies to teach anatomy and surgery. Now over 60 universities are studying their legacies of slavery. This map shows where Washington, D.C. would be built. In the 1790s, it was all plantations. You see the names of the plantations in capital letters and the names of the owners, men and women, in lowercase. Jenkins Hill, right here in the middle, becomes Capitol Hill. Georgetown University, you see Georgetown on the far left up here? Georgetown University had opened in 1789 with its eight plantations. Both the Catholic men and women's schools owned slaves. By 1830, future President Andrew Jackson had conquered the land from the Florida panhandle to New Orleans, opening up the Mississippi to US goods from the north. He had forced treaties on the native peoples along the way conceding their land. The American Indian Removal Act of 1830 forced these people and the 5,000 African Americans they owned to walk to Indian territory, which we now know as the Trail of Tears. B.C.'s Franklin's father, David Burney, was born in Tennessee in 1820, enslaved to the Burney Chickasaw family. As a teenager in the 1830s, he walks with his owners loading and unloading their wagons from Tennessee to Chickasaw Nation in southeastern Indian Territory. He freed himself and became a rancher with spreads of land for his cattle, horses, and orchards. He enlists in the Union Army as David Franklin. He marries Millie, a Choctaw freedwoman. My grandfather opens his autobiography, My Life in an Era, as follows. I was born the sixth day of May, 1879, near Homer, a small country village in what was then Pickens County, Chickensaw Nation, Indian Territory. I was the seventh of 10 children born to David and Millie Franklin. Dad was born in Tennessee, not far from Gallatin, and mother was born in Mississippi, not far from Biloxi. I was christened Buck in honor of my grandfather, Buck." End of quote. B.C. enjoys the company of adults and learns to ride and rope cattle at an early age. He travels with his father to the Panhandle, Kansas, and Colorado to sell their cattle. In 1894, he was sent to Dawes Academy in Berwyn for high school and rides back home on horseback each weekend. This is the earliest photo. That's the Trail of Tears, you see, coming from Tennessee. Can you imagine walking from Tennessee to Chickasaw Nation? How long does that take? There's no highways. <laughs> okay. We recreated this map of uh, early Oklahoma for Grandpa's autobiography so that you can see He's born here in Homer. This is Paul's Valley. Near, this is near Paul's Valley. Hello. <laughs> he goes to um, school in Berwyn, and then he goes to Tennessee, and then he comes back and he lives in Springer. Um, 
Berwyn, and then eventually uh, in Rentersville. This is the earliest photo we have of Grandpa here on the right next to his older brother, Matthew. In 1896, he then goes to Roger Williams University in Nashville, where he meets my grandmother, Molly Parker. They study with John Hope, for whom they will name their second son. These two photos are taken in the Carver's Brothers studio in Nashville in 1899 and 1901. So these are taken in Nashville, not in Tulsa. During his summers, he works in Chicago and Milwaukee, going back and forth to Nashville as a Pullman porter. Grandpop follows John Hope to Atlanta Baptist, which we now know as Morehouse, where he finishes in the class of 1903. While my parents, grandparents were in college, petroleum and natural gas are discovered in Indian Territory, and Tulsa becomes the oil capital of the world. It attracts the Rockefellers, J. Paul Getty, where they make their fortunes before following petroleum to Texas, California, and Saudi Arabia. Much of the petroleum and natural gas is in, is in the eastern part of the territory allotted to Native Americans and African Americans. This map shows the allotments of both communities in the, just in the Muscogee Creek Nation. African Americans were allotted 1,192,240 acres between 1899 and 1906, shown in blue. My grandparents are married in 1903. This grandpa in the class of 1903 seated second from the left with a book on his lap. My grandparents are married in 1903 and begin their lives as teachers and farmers in Springer and Ardmore. Fascinated by the law, Grandpa apprentices with black lawyers in Ardmore and takes correspondence courses with the Sprague School of Law in Detroit from 1904 to 1907. He could, of course, not attend law school in Oklahoma. He took the oral exam of the bar and scored second highest and is admitted to the Oklahoma bar in December 1907, one month after statehood. The first law passed by the state legislature is to assure that transportation is segregated. The segregation of education is next. Grandpa says in his autobiography that he went and discussed the opposition, his opposition to both laws with the governor. Here is Grandpa with other black lawyers outside their firm in 1910. That's Grandpop's horse and buggy of the time. He wrote that in the margin of the photograph. Inside the office, that's Grandpop on the left, his law partners, their secretary, and on the far left up here, you see a photograph of President Howard Taft. By 1915, Woodrow Wilson is president and imposes strict segregation on Washington, D.C. and federal offices, dismissing many black federal employees. His classmate at Johns Hopkins, Thomas Dixon, has written The Klansman, which D.W. Griffith films as Birth of a Nation, demonizing African Americans, particularly during Reconstruction, and celebrating the Ku Klux Klan. With the end of World War I, black troops returned from Europe where those with guns have fought under the French flag and won French medals, the Croix de Guerre. Those under the US flag loaded and unloaded ships and dug ditches and graves under white Southern officers. The return of these African American veterans is met with extreme hostility and many are lynched in their uniforms during the red summer of 1919. Representing a client in Shreveport, Louisiana, BC is seated in the court with his client when the case is called. He stands with his client, and the judge asks, why is he standing in his courtroom? Grandpop replies that he is there to represent his client, upon, whereupon the judge says, no nigga is representing anyone in my courtroom. Sit down or get out. In 1912, he moves to one of the all-black towns, Rentersville, recruited by the city fathers. There he works three jobs as postmaster, teacher, and farmer, and doesn't get much legal work. 
There's a backstory that I have, I have time to go into. He's a Baptist. He's a Methodist. They're Baptists, and they say they don't trust Baptists. <laughs> they don't trust Methodists, so they won't give him any work. So, a friend and husband of Roger William of theirs from Roger Williams suggests that more legal work should be available in Tulsa. February 1921, he moves to Tulsa and into the prosperous and bustling Greenwood neighborhood. There he established his law practice with P.A. Chappelle on Greenwood. He moves into I.W. Thompson's rooming house. The community has many businesses, furniture and jewelry stores, grocery stores, restaurants, drug stores, the Dreamland Theater, Caver's Cleaners, Doc and Eastman and Hughes Cafe, the Gurley Hotel, the Midway Hotel, the Stratford Hotel. Real estate and oil leasing offices, professional offices of doctors, dentists, and lawyers. There are a dozen churches, including Mount Zion Baptist, Vernon AME, and First Baptist Church North. Grandpa Franklin meets people like O.W. and Emma Gurley, who had bought the original 40 acres that formed Greenwood. Gurley built the first two-story building that housed a rooming house and a grocery store. He met John and Lula Williams, who opened the East End Garage, an ice cream parlor, and the Dreamland Theater. He met caterer Cleora Butler and Tulsa Star editor A.J. Smitherman. Grandpop had left Grandmom and his two youngest children, Anne Harriet and John Hope, in Rentersville, while Grandmom finished teaching the rest of the school year. They were to join Grandpop in Tulsa in June. By this time, 41 blacks had been lynched in Oklahoma, and a white man had been lynched in Tulsa in April of 1921. On May 31st, Grandpa recalls the following. It is also commencement season, and the streets of the city are filled all day long with happy, innocent, carefree graduates, colored in white, walking proudly with their caps and gowns. The colored graduates are dreaming, building air castles, and in their waking dreams, they see themselves rising, mounting higher and higher up the ladder of recognition and renown. But alas, their dreams are like Ponzi's financial bubble. I just love the way he writes. I had had an unusually hard day of it at court and in my office. By noon, I had finished the trial for a, of a land case that was begun two days before. I had spent the entire afternoon briefing a lawsuit docketed for the trial the following week, and so I retired rather early. But the shooting continued. I arose, dressed, and went to the phone to call the sheriff's office to find out the trouble. I could not make connection. The next thought was my office, and to it I hastened. Upon reaching Greenwood Avenue, the street upon which my office was then and is now, I found the street congested with humanity and vehicles of all kinds and descriptions. After an hour or so, I returned to my room. I soliloquized, here I am, a peaceable and law-abiding citizen. I have harmed no one, just like thousands of others of my race here, and yet I cannot walk through the street upon a peaceful mission in safety. This seemed hard to me, you see, I had never been in a mob before. Up to then, I knew absolutely nothing about mob psychology. Since becoming a man, I have always been kept busy and never had an occasion to study the mob spirit. I had thought foolishly, I suppose, that a peaceable, law-abiding citizen could go wherever he had business. Upon the streets, I was rudely disillusioned. About midnight, I rose and went to the north porch of the second floor of my hotel. And looking in a northwesterly direction, I saw the top of Stan Pipe Hill literally lighted up by the blazes that came from the throats of machine guns. And I could hear, hear bullets whizzing and cutting the air. They were shooting now in every direction, and the sounds that came from the thousands of guns was deafening. When the eastern sky reddened, announcing the approach of day, I was still standing on that upper porch, thinking, thinking. And how different was the coming of this day from that of the day before. I reached my office in safety, but I knew that safety would be short-lived. 
I knew now the mob spirit. I knew that government and law and order had broken down. I knew that mob law had been substituted in all of its fiendishness and barbarity. I knew that the mobists cared nothing about the written law and the Constitution. And I also now knew that he had neither the patience nor the intelligence distinguished between the good and the bad, the law-abiding and the lawless in my race. From my office window, I could see planes circling in midair. They grew in number and hummed and darted and dipped low. I could hear something like hail falling on top of my office building. Down East Archer, I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire, burning from its top. And then another and another and another begin building began to burn from the top. What? An attack from the air, too, I asked myself. Lurid flames roared and belched and licked their forked tongues in the air. Smoke ascended the sky in thick black volumes and emitted all the planes, now a dozen or more in number, still hummed and darted here and there with the agility, natural agility of birds of the air. Then a filling station farther down East Archer caught fire from the top. I feared now explosion and decided to try to move to safer quarters. I came out of my office and locked the door and descended to the foot of the steps. The sidewalks were literally covered with burning turpentine balls. I knew all too well where they came from and knew all too well while every burning building first caught from the top. I paused and waited for an opportune time to escape. Where or where are our splendid fire department with its half dozen stations? I asked myself, is the city in conspiracy with the mob? I again asked myself, as I stood there in contemplation of these and other gruesome facts, I saw two sights that will live in my memory to my dying days. One was a woman on the opposite side of the street. She was traveling south, hair disentangled and disheveled in the very path of whizzing bullets. She was wildly calling to a little tot that a few moments before had dashed in panic before her and turned off Greenwood on Archer at the corner. I hollered to her, turn back, woman. For God's sake, turn back. You will be mown down. Never turning her head, she answered as she hurried on, I must follow my child. And so she did follow her child, and not a bullet touched her although they literally rain down the street. This brave, self-denying mother lives here in Tulsa, and with her that tot, now a splendid young lady, whom she risked her life to save. The other sight was occasioned by the Pira building catching on fire from the top. This was a frame building then. The fire dislodged those in the building, a woman, two children, and three men. They emerged in wild confusion and came on in my direction. The little children, they were both girls, outran the others and passed the place where I was standing with the speed of the wind. The woman ran across the street and onto the foot of the steps of my office building, right where I was standing, and fell upon her knees and commenced to pray, totally oblivious to my presence. I don't think she ever saw me, and such a prayer. She asked God to save her and her children for, what the, for whom she'd just been separated. This prayer was uttered over and over. I'm not able to say whether that prayer was answered or not. I have lived in Tulsa continuously since that memorable morning, but I have never seen that woman since. I would know her if I were to meet her even today. The three men, one of whom lugged a heavy trunk on his shoulder, were all killed as they were crossing the street, killed before my very eyes. That's the end of his passage. Mary Parrish, in her eyewitness account and interviews with survivors of the massacre, say that men who invaded their homes and took their pride possessions before setting fire to the curtains were accompanied by the eight, their eight to 16-year-old sons. Grandpa was rounded up by the white mob and interned in Convention Hall, which now has a sign, Tulsa Theater, on it. Really? That building is still the Convention Hall where my grandfather was interned. You can call it Brady Theater, you can call it anything. He was interned there for several days. 
He was able to send word to my grandmother that he was unharmed. Everything he'd prepared to receive his family was gone. Money, clothes, personal effects. The only building left standing was Booker T. Washington High School, which the Red Cross used as a hospital and to distribute food and supplies to the hundreds left homeless. Grandpop set up his office in a tent with I.H. Spears and Effie Thompson as their secretary, a classmate of his from Roger Williams, who with her husband had lost their drugstore in the fire. Together they processed insurance claims for the businesses and homeowners of Greenwood. None would be honored. The city council passed an ordinance requiring those to rebuild with non-flammable materials, which Grandpop successfully fought to the state Supreme Court. It would take years to rebuild Greenwood, and when our family was reunited in 1925, Greenwood was still under construction. This is a man photographing the remnants of his home. My grandmother established the first daycare permitting black women to leave their children in safety while they worked outside of the home. This is my father on the right in front of his school in Rentisville. So my grandmother had to care for her two children in the four years between the massacre and the family being able to rebuild. So my father's sister on the right lower side, Anne Harriet, maybe in some kind of pageant. This is my father to the right of that triangle, which says, hi, why? This is dad at Booker T in maybe 1928, 30. There he is in the center, front row, valedictorian at Booker T, 1930. There he is by himself. And here are my grandmother and grandfather reunited in 1925 in Tulsa. Have a few more pictures of Grandpa. This is a photo I just found. I know you can't see it well, but the lady is pointing to a sign that says B.C. Franklin, attorney. That's the street sign to his office. And this is my favorite picture of him, just striding downtown. <laughs> and here he is seated on the left as president of the North Tulsa um, Pioneers Society. And I think it's just a wonderful cross-section of age and gender of North Tulsa. This is taken in 1950. So you can see that, that men and women who are his age are probably also survivors of the massacre. This is the only picture I have of my grandmother by herself. She was a woman involved in the National Council of Negro Women, all the women's organizations of Oklahoma. The final portrait of my grandfather. And <laughs> he's receiving, he's had a stroke by this time. So his right side, he used to type with these two fingers. And then he taught, he typed two 400 page single space drafts of his autobiography with this finger. Is that Will or what? So let's go back to the original B.C. Franklin Clinic. Now we'll turn to the contemporary B.C. Franklin Clinic and the students, Connor Doyle and Jack Schaefer, will join me on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon <clears throat> and welcome. My name is Mimi Martin, and I am now the Associate Dean of Experiential Learning and teaching the B.C. Franklin Legal Clinic. There are not enough words to say thank you. Um, 
but I will try anyway to Mr. John Franklin for that incredible and fascinating and educating presentation. Every time I hear you speak, every time we speak on the phone, I learn so much. Your knowledge, your wisdom, your commitment to public interest, and your presence here in our law school and in our clinic yesterday is nothing short of fantastic. I also want to thank you for this trust you placed in us when you grant us permission to use your grandfather's name for our clinic. Uh, the story of the clinic is interesting. Uh, two years ago, actually this month, several alums approached President Dean and and asked her why we didn't have a clinic in North Tulsa. Lynn then asked me the question, and our response was, well, then let's do it. The alums then went to work, and in four days raised $37,000 for the new clinic and for a student scholar. Leading this effort were alums Stephanie Jackson, <laughs> and Dwayne Midget. We recently lost Duane. <clears throat> he is greatly missed. I did not meet Duane until this project started, and suddenly I had this cheerleading man behind me saying, We can do this. As we say in my tradition, may his memory be a blessing. The next question that we asked was, What would the name of this clinic be? And Lynn had an idea. What else would it be but the Butt Colbert Franklin Legal Clinic? Listening to you tell the story of your grandfather so eloquently. Uh, every time I hear the story of his work, I am again re-inspired. It is B.C. Franklin's unfaltering commitment to community and to justice that we so strive to emulate in the B.C. Franklin Legal Clinic's second iteration. It is for these reasons that Lynn contacted John Franklin and said, can we use your grandfather's name? The next step, of course, was funding. And I want to recognize the Sanford and Irene Bernstein Foundation, who place their trust in us to carry out this sacred mission and who are always at our side no matter what we do. I want to welcome and recognize Elizabeth Hall, the program director of the Bernstein Foundation, who, whatever I call her and say, this is what we want to do, her response is, that's it. You don't get to do this work. <laughs> the BC Franklin Legal Clinic Number Two launched in the fall of 2021. Fast forward to its third semester now, and I just want to give you a glimpse of the work that we have done in Mr. Franklin's grandfather's name. We have represented community members in cases of divorce, child custody, child support, protective orders, guardianships, expungement and commutation of extensive sentences. We have filed a transfer <clears throat> on death deed and a posthumous quit claim deed. We have filed for trademarks. We have incorporated an organization and are now filing for 501c3 status of that organization with the IRS. We have drafted paternity petitions, guided community members in filing unemployment appeals and are currently working on a VA disability case, two DUI cases with the assistance of our fantastic public defender's office, and we are defending parents in what is essentially a deprived proceeding disguised as a guardianship. I can't talk about that case or we will be here for four hours. <laughs> um, I would ask all the students who are here who have been or are currently enrolled in the clinic to stand. These students are our pride and joy. Um, they are tasked with the very heavy duty of carrying on your grandfather's legacy. Uh, we take that very seriously. And it is now my pride and pleasure to introduce two outstanding BC Franklin Clinic students who have now worked in the clinic in various capacities for three semesters. We're not letting them graduate in May, I've decided. <laughs> Sorry, Dean. They have represented individuals expungement and excessive sentencing cases and they have worked with a community group on a larger advocacy project. They are now working on a fascinating research project that grew out of that project and in the spirit of your grandfather they are tireless, passionate, inquisitive and not to be deterred, committed to our mandate and 
and they have gone to such lengths as driving to Texas to retrieve important documents. Today they will engage with John, who has modestly agreed to be the moderator and ask our, our students questions. We hope that this will eventually lead to both a law review article and a tool for the community. Let me just say that I have tried several times to narrow their project and have been told no way because they are committed to telling the whole story. And so without further ado, I give you Jack Schaefer and Connor Doyle with John Whittington Franklin for an amazing, incredible conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mimi. I spent a lovely day yesterday with the students of the clinic, and uh, we had a conversation last week about them joining me on stage and uh, having a discussion. First, I'd like to know from both of you how my grandfather's work has inspired you. Well, I think it was his uh, overturning of the ordinance for the rebuilding in Greenwood that kind of kicked off my curiosity. Uh, you know, it was rebuilt, and then uh, Jack and I, growing up in Tulsa, uh, we've never seen what Greenwood was. Uh, so his work for the rebuilding just kicked off my curiosity to research. Can you hear him? Uh, the, uh, the B.C. Franklin's overturning of the uh, ordinance for rebuilding Greenwood. Uh, Jack and I grew up in Tulsa, and we never saw what Greenwood was. And so knowing how hard he worked to have it rebuilt and that it was rebuilt, it, it just really kicked off my curiosity to find out what happened to it the second time. Um, and then through the clinic, just the the advocacy for whatever need arises for the community. I think for me, you know, something that Professor Martin always says, that I think is true for the students as well, um, is that we feel a tremendous sense of responsibility um, in the clinic taking on your grandfather's name. Um, the, for B.C. Franklin, really, as far as we know, that's the clinic that he set up in the tent in the aftermath of the race massacre was really the first, you know, pop-up legal clinic of its, of its kind in, in the world, as far as we know. And to be able to, you know, in some small way, carry on that legacy of providing legal services for a community that, 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 that is in need of it, um, this is really, for me, an honor and a privilege. Now, I know that uh, you've been in the clinic since last year and into this year, and you've undertaken your own research in land use. Can you please share with us what you've learned? Sure, so I, I think the project kind of, the genesis of the project was that we learned, you know, in, in the cl clinic classes, it's not just in a, um, you know, experiential, it's also a classroom setting where we do learn about the history of Tulsa. Um, one thing that, you know, even growing up in Tulsa, I never really knew was that even in the aftermath of the massacre, and thanks in no small part to B.C. Franklin's efforts to overturn the ordinance that Connor was talking about, the community, you know, rebuilt itself, and, and, and by some accounts, to even, you know, greater heights than it saw before the massacre. Um, and it wasn't really until the middle of the century, things like urban planning, the interstate highway system, that really saw the Greenwood neighborhood, you know, kind of transformed into the, what it is today. And so trying to uncover that, you know, story um, and tell that story, which is a very, as Professor Martin was saying, it's a very long story, a lot of um, different aspects. But that, that for us was really, I think, the, the genesis of the story, Connor. Yeah. Um, one, one very interesting thing was that Greenwood was this walkable, mixed-use community, and now there's a lot of vacant land, and one of the goals of the city is to create this walkable, mixed-use uh, neighborhood again. And so just finding out how we got away from that and then why we're shifting back to that and why we didn't keep it, uh, that really just sparked my interest, and I wanted to know why we seem to have wasted so much time going back and forth between the two, and why we didn't just continue that, if that's what we want today. Well, one of the things that I've learned is that um, there were there were there were mines below the city. That this, that Greenwood was zoned industrial. 
Have you learned anything about it being zoned industrial and why Greenwood was zoned industrial? So one, one interesting thing, so immediately in the aftermath of the massacre, um, there were multiple commissions put together by the city of Tulsa. And from that, the, one of the goals that arose from that was to rezone Greenwood as an industrial zone to move the black population farther north. Uh, and so for our research project and what we looked at, it was interesting to us that in the, in the rebuilding of Greenwood, that didn't happen. However, over decades and decades of different redevelopments um, and different projects, uh, that that seemed to have happened over time. Uh, and so that's, that's just one thing that we, we thought was very interesting, that, that that was the goal after the massacre to prevent the rebuilding, uh, which was not achieved. However, over the subsequent decades, it seemed to have been moved forward. Have you gotten up to the period of when the highway was built through and redestroyed the community? Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've taken a look at you know, the Interstate Highway um, Act and, and sort of the way that eminent domain was used in, in certain parts of the city to build the Crosstown Expressway and then parts of the IDL as well um, in the Greenwood neighborhood. Um, and yeah, it's been really um, interesting just to see the, the, how the decisions were made in terms of which parts of the city to use for those highways, um, you know, where to place them, and just the kind of processes, that the, the legal processes that were used as well in that, in that uh, efforts. I've looked at the highway system across, particularly the north, northeastern corridor, and the interstate system systematically destroyed black communities, and particularly black businesses communities, from Rhode Island to North Carolina. Uh, I introduced Professor Martin the other day to another law clinic professor who was reached by, who was contacted by a community whose community had been, a black community whose community had been destroyed by a highway, and they successfully have had the highway removed. And I told her, <laughs> I told the, Professor Archer at NYU that I have another friend who's a law clinic in Tulsa and it's dealing with Tulsa and its highway. So you never know how these communications uh, take off. Um, but I was just riding up the Northeast Corridor a couple of weeks ago and these highways systematically destroyed communities. In Richmond, they destroyed 700 homes and businesses. And you drive to Richmond on 95 and there's a church almost hanging over the highway that was told it could be torn down, it could move, or it could stay where it is. And so the highway comes like right by the foundations. And opposite it is the first black bank of Richmond. Those are the only two buildings that survived the highway coming through. So anything else you learned from, the, from your research? I know it's ongoing. I, I think for me, one of the things that you see so much that we've come across in, in our research and, and in talking with, with members of the community is just how much some of the th themes and lessons that we've been learning about kind of echo time after time throughout you know, the history of both Tulsa and, and the United States you know, in, in general in terms of um, land use, um, urban you know, redevelopment and renewal. These questions about you know, who has agency in these decisions that are being made to renew certain communities, right? Are the, is this, this development something that's being done with and, and for the local communities or you know, being done to them? You, you, you see those things just pop up. Um, it's, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable, um, the similarities between different sort of instances of you know, or, or urban renewal in, in cities and, and how just similar the processes are for all of them. Of course, in the interstate systems initiated in the 50s, before African Americans have the power to vote that they had in the subsequent decades. And I know it's specifically in the case of Tulsa, communities that were empowered went to Washington to make sure that the highway did not come through their neighborhood. If you know Washington, D.C., we have a beltway, and the top of the beltway is like, like, like that. It's because Senators said, oh, you're not having it come in my neighborhood. 
So it's a matter of political power where you're able to have highways uh, be diverted, let's put it that way. Now, I know that you have undertaken other work other than your the research was sort of extracurricular. Yes. <laughs> And I want to con commend them for doing this work on <laughs> land use. But what other kind of cases have, what cases have you been handling? Well, uh, Jack and I completed the first divorce for the clinic. Um, and, and family law has really become a focus for the clinic. Uh, there was a needs assessment done uh, by the first semester of the clinic. And one thing that kept coming up was this need for uh, access to representation for family law matters. Um, so we've done a divorce. Uh, we've also done uh, an expungement. We're working on that right now. Uh, commutation. Uh, but really, it's what identifying it within the community what they need and just helping with what they do. The, uh, the divorce was an interesting process uh, because of how simple and complicated it was at the exact same time. Uh, there's the, it should be able to be done pro se, but our client was having a lot of trouble uh, learning where to file exactly what's right. Uh, so we were able to come in and, and help her with that. Right. Can, just, can yeah. you tell me what expungement is? I heard it yesterday. <laughs> I have no idea what expungement is. So, so for example, our client, um, he 20 years ago was pulled over for speeding, uh, and it turned into a drug search, and so. He has a felony on his record now. Um, he called us and just said that he's up for a job, and he, uh, his job told him that he would have to you know, take the felon box, and they were going to do a background check. Uh, so he came to us, and what we can do for him is go through a process since the, uh, the laws have been changed, and what he had would not have been a felony anymore. And we're able to go to the courts and have them expunge his record so he will not have a felony on his record. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, I was going to say, too, just going off of what Connor was talking about on, on the divorce case, I mean, this was a very, like he was saying, it should have been a very simple case. I mean, it was, it was a very amicable divorce. The two parties had basically agreed upon the distribution of assets and all the other things that were going to be part of the settlement agreement. And it was still so difficult just to deal with the bureaucracy of figuring out how these court systems worked. And I think COVID also um, played some role in making that more difficult. Some rules were changed um, during COVID. That may, uh, some still are in place, some are not. And it's really difficult to f figure out how just how the court system works. If, if you're not, even for us as, as law students, it was difficult. And so we can only imagine for people who are trying to deal with those systems you know, on their own, how difficult it must be to work with those. But I think for me, in, in general, the, the biggest lesson that I've learned in working with you know, clients for the clinic is just how large of a demand there is for legal services um, in, in, in North Tulsa, and that the supply that's there really just doesn't meet the demand. And, and there are a lot of you know, great nonprofit organizations and, and other, other agencies you know, like, like the clinic who are doing some really great work, but they're all just incredibly overwhelmed with the amount of people that, that need their services. And so I really hope that we can see more development in that area moving forward. When I first learned about the clinic last year, you were going through the needs assessment and trying to find out where people were and what they needed. How did that process re lead to the point now where the phone is ringing off the hook? <laughs> well, I, th I think what, what that needs assessment identified was this need for the services in the family law. Um, it's, it's just one of those aspects that touches so many people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis um, and, and can be handled at a clinic level by students. It's a great learning experience. Uh, but really, that needs assessment was just, we felt the need to tailor the clinic's uh, services to the community's needs because you know, we can come in and do uh, what we think is good to learn from, but, but I think what we as students really get out of it is that fulfillment of we're actually helping someone's life. And those family law, the, the divorces, the guardianships, uh, the VA benefits, everything like that, that's just such a, a daily life activity for so many people that it's, it's really fulfilling to work with. 
or have there been any surprises? I know that you know you you, you study law in class, and then you're in the real world. Are there things that you have not expected? Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, procedure. I mean, that's something that we. It's hard to learn in class, but through the clinic, we go to the courthouse. We <laughs> figure out which file cabinets to pick things up in, which <laughs> which things to drop off. Um, it's just something you wouldn't be able to know in class, and so it's that's <laughs> the procedure aspect, especially in Tulsa County. Is it's very interesting to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think also just in, in, you know, for us seeing the way that members of the community that we serve interact with the justice system, I mean, you see a lot of attitudes that, you know, perhaps we naively kind of hoped were relics of the past that are, you know, very much still in, in play today. Um, and so just being able to see those uh, more in, in, in person is definitely a real eye opener, I think, for us as well. We'd love to open it to the audience. If you have questions or comments, please raise your hand and I see the dean has a microphone. I would like to speak to an issue. The influence of your father and my brother in my life, you know, to follow your comments about the highway. In today's society, there's a highway being driven through the African American family by discouraging fathers to be involved in the children's lives. If they're not there, then they put money into the mother's life. So there are many uh, good fathers who had not been able to have sufficient employment, and they want their children to be able to be cared for and loving for their children. They would be away from raising their children. So the fatherlessness today is the elephant in the living room of our country. When you look at the number of men and women in prison who are fatherless. How many children today, tonight in Tulsa, went to bed without a father in their house? It's like a roof, house without a roof. So the highway has been divided to separate out fathers from their involvement in the Tulsa County Health System. I'd like you to comment on that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we definitely, see, you know, Connor and I both before our time uh, at the clinic worked at the public defender's office for project commutation. Um, um, and, you know, certainly you see a lot of um, the impact that one's, you know, home life can have on their future life outcomes um, is, is definitely really, really important. And so, you know, absolutely, there are, there are all kinds of, um, you know, barriers, both physical and, and, and symbolic, that are, you know, really, really um, important for, for outcomes. In those communities, yeah. yeah the, the, uh, how easy it is to be caught up in the criminal justice system um, and the legal system in general, and and how that affects being able to just be at home and the resources that then you're are taken away because you have to pay things like fine fees, um, and just how much resources that extracts from a community that then could have gone to child rearing. Mimi, do you want to add anything to that? I think one of the things also that this is on <laughs> uh, that we see a lot and, and that the students study it isn't just learning how to do a divorce although I will never forget Jack and Connor's face in the courtroom where they found me and said we found the right box to leave <laughs> the meetings in that was a moment um, but in addition to learning how to do this it's understanding over police communities right and how that criminal justice system grabs families and keep them wrapped in there so that one legal issue turns into 10. Destroying families, destroying businesses, uh, losing jobs and homes, and having children put in a foster care system, and losing your right to parent. And so that's been a really big point of the, the clinic to really understand how this happens, right? So, so you could look at the prison. This is a question I ask every year on day one looked at the prison system and just looked at it and said, wow, that's filled with black and brown men. What might you conclude if you didn't know history, right? Well, that's all the people that are committing crimes. Now you look at context and history and understand how that happens. That has nothing to 
do with keeping anybody safe, but instead with over-policing. And, and when we started this uh, clinic, before we opened its doors, in meeting with several community leaders, we were told, we love that you're going to be representing people individually. We want you to see the bigger picture here and working with the community like the history of the land use issues, right? So that your students understand context and that we do larger advocacy projects, like getting the highway uh, <laughs> removed. What do you think, Brad? Ms. Nash? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is wonderful. One of the questions I have for you is, have you seen this need around housing and fair housing? And certainly coming out of the pandemic, um, there was this moratorium, but now it's lifting. And are there illegal things going on there? Or have you thought about doing a needs assessment? Because that's something that could potentially sneak up on. And we know the value of not necessarily home ownership, but home stability. Yeah, that's absolutely absolutely an issue that we've we've kind of thought and spoken quite a bit about. Um, I know one of our you know fellow clinics, the Terry West Deal Clinic, has done quite a bit of work around um, housing issues in Tulsa. Going to I know the students there have been going to the eviction docket in Tulsa, just kind of observing and, and writing up reports about you know what they've seen go on there. Um, I actually spent some time there volunteering as well with Legal Aid um, last year, um, and yeah, you definitely I, I think see a lot of I would say that there's definitely you know, some sort of kind of built-in things in, in, that, in that court that do tend to favor landlords overall. And so you definitely do see um, outcomes that I would say on the whole are probably not you know, the fair, are fair, fair outcomes for tenants there, especially now that the moratorium has been lifted. Um, I would say also just more broadly, definitely just the issues of you know, housing, in, in communities where you, you're seeing, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, um, you know, much more in, in increases in the amount of homes that are being you know, um, rented out versus just owned by the, the occupants of the house. That's kind of another avenue that we're thinking about with our research projects um, and just talking about as, as, as kind of part of that trend of, of, of land use and land ownership. Good morning. Having the opportunity to meet uh, all of you and know Mr. Franklin longer, but my name is Dr. Jerry Goodwin, and the idea is that in terms of the research that you're doing, uh, have you located uh, in terms of policy law? Have you had that uh, prominent or preeminent uh, law or policy that you think should be established that might address, uh, in light of some of the significance of the research you've done, is there anything that rises to the top? Have you had the opportunity to talk to a legislator or to someone uh, in a position of authority? What would be a policy or law that you might advocate that would go to the heart of, of the uh, conclusions of your research? Um, one, one interesting thing that we've been studying and, and looking at is uh, there's multiple ways to do this, but uh, community benefits agreements, uh, community land trusts. Uh, so what that does is it, it, it allows the community to control the development, uh, either through owning the land or making sure that there's provisions in place that the community is able to actually benefit from the development that's occurring. And so what, what we're really looking at is a way that this development is not just, uh, you know, helping the overall city, but uh, in a way that creates generational wealth that the community doesn't lose control and uh, really is able to to take what they want and to see and what that act, the community needs uh, from within. I knew you were an amazing student because I wanted you all to talk about when you did your assessment, um, if you can, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but when you talked about um, the needs, it's not just the criminal or the family law, but how we can bring in generational wealth for the families in the community who own homes but don't know how to change and transfer and convey the asset. And so talk a little bit about what you all did in your assessment, because it's not just about criminal. You're looking at how we build Greenwood, how you build this community back up and, and continue continue or show show how we do generational wealth. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I know there's, there's a few cases that the clinic is handling right now uh, that is actually working on the title of the home. and. Uh, what happened is one generation died, 
they kept their, their name was on the title of the home and, and now they're the grandchildren and they need, to, they need our help to just go through the legal process to make sure that they own the home, they won't lose anything, it, it goes to the correct people. Uh, and so yeah, I think that's a, it's a huge thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then Barbara Eichner in the middle of the room right there. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. My name is Brenda Nails Alfort, and I am a proud alum of the University of Tulsa. And I wanted to say thank you personally to your grandfather for allowing our family, my grandparents were survivors of the race massacre and Black Wall Street entrepreneurs, James and Bassanor Nels Sr. And I get emotional, I'm sorry. But thank you for allowing our family to rebuild after our businesses were destroyed, our homes. Thank you so very, very much. And I just can't believe that I have this opportunity to stand on their shoulders and in their memory to say that to you. And for their daughter, Dr. Cecilia Nels Palmer, to grow up to become the first black faculty member here at the University of Tulsa. I am so honored. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you so much to you, all three of you for um, the insight you've offered today. Um, I'm really curious about the land use question. I'm doing some historical research about Greenwood. And for me, a big challenge of explaining what happened is the question of intentionality. Um, if you go back to right after the Rice Massacre, the intentions are just laid out there. It's in the grand jury indictment, it's in the Tulsa world. Everyone in the white elite is saying what they want to do about moving Greenwood. Fast forward 30, 40, 50 years, it's illegal to say that kind of stuff in public, that we're trying to move black people, we're trying to discriminate. All these uh, anti-discrimination laws that were passed in the 60s made that illegal. And so I find it very difficult personally to sort of find the intentionality of the highway removal or of urban renewal. And I'm sort of curious in your research whether you've found documents, statements um, by people in power in Oklahoma that would say directly what they were trying to do in terms of moving Greenwood or discriminating against the black community. So, I mean, like you, we've also found documents talking about the, you know, kind of the immediate aftermath of, of the race massacre, that intentionality. Um, to this point, I don't think there's a, you know, it's necessarily a, a smoking gun that we found that would show that, you know, later on down the road. But, you know, I would say that when you look at, you know, the, the, the intentions there and, and, you know, some of the actions that were, that were taken, I mean, it definitely tells, you know, one story kind of of, of the efforts that were taken. So I don't know that there's necessarily a, a, a smoking gun, but I definitely understand, you know, what, what you're saying and, and, and I would agree with it. Oren, can you give it to the lady right behind Ms. Nash there? And then I want to hear from Jim Goodwin. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Barbara Eichner Thompson. And my question is, with all the research that you've done, what is the common denominator? When you look at the legal system, the family services system, the criminal justice, real estate, it's easy to say that it is race-based. But what is the common denominator? In my mind, it all comes down to the dollar. The criminal justice system is privatized throughout this country, so someone's making money. The fact that children and families are being torn apart, there are organizations that are sprouting up and they're getting rich, both private and public. So what is the real common denom denominator for the racist behavior, the way the government is operating? Is it really people just don't like me because I'm black or is it because someone wants to get rich and keep me in poverty. What's your comment? I, I think it's it's hard to deny the the financial uh, motives behind, especially the land use that we've seen. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard to ignore the monetization of the systemic issues, and really the rebuilding of who's going to have the the benefit of the new developments and who's going to own the land and who's going to control it. So I, I agree with you. Yeah, and I think, Sue, it's, for me, it's the answer is, is, is all the above. It's both, right? I mean, I think it's sometimes hard to disentangle those two um, motivations. I mean, I think that, that absolutely there are plenty of 
people and organizations out there who you know do have that profit motive out there involved with, with the legal system. But you know the same actions aren't always you know carried out in, in poor black communities as they are in, in poor white communities, right? And so um, I, I think it's hard to just disentangle those two kind of effects, you know, in terms of the the profit motive and and, and the racism. I think they're, they're they're both there. I think we have time for one more question. Is there I, one more? I have a request. I don't know all of you in the room, but I know that Jim Goodwin actually knew my grandfather. So I'd just like you to give some reflections, Jim, on Grandpa BC. <laughs> well, for those of you um, who have seen a picture of him, you're looking at a personification in John W. Um, <clears throat> BC Franklin, I had to be, it had to be in the late 40s or 50s. As a young man, I was in his office. And he had bookshelves similar to those in your conference room, Dean. He epitomized a rectitude, his appearance, he gave you the, the aura of being a very principled man, his intonation, his, his, the way he walked, the way he talked, was very like, regal and inspirational. But you could tell, in fact, as you read the eloquence about his, in his book, he spoke that way my recollection. And of course, as a young person, uh, for him to make that impression of me, I, it's not something that you would think about repeatedly, but he made that kind of impression um, <coughs> on me as a, as a young toddler. I guess I may have been in the early 50s when I was in his office. I don't remember the occasion, but you are, you personify really in many ways how he was. And before I yield this microphone, I just uh, a meeting earlier. You indicated in your research in Texas that you saw a written document where there was a avowed intent uh, to remove the black population from Greenwood. Did you not tell me that? Well, what, what I think what I was talking about was um, a book that I was reading about the the Model Cities program here in Tulsa, talking about the. Um, idea that the administrators of the program, you know, sort of had the understanding that this removal, you know, of the, of the community would be, you know, potentially part of the outcome of, of the program. Um, but certainly we've also found documents, not necessarily in, in Texas, but, you know, think, talking about the aftermath of the, of the massacre, about that being the, the intention of many of the, the leaders of, of Tulsa, yeah. Okay. And one last thing, the, the significance of uh, Greenwood in, in the context of our experience here in America. I think Greenwood is significant uh, and resounds around the world in that other, where there's bloodshed and carnage in other parts of the United States where black communities had prospered. They were destroyed but never recovered. Uh, Tulsa is significant in that it did recover. And that, ha that um, heritage is still, there's a glimmer of it still here. But I think it's so important for the black population to keep it in, in its place, not necessarily from a segregation point of view, but it represents that community, his reputation that white superiority was a massive lie. And in some evidence, we as Oklahoma, we are in our 100th year as well. It's been difficult and yet, uh, my only lament is that I'm 83 and not 23 there's great uh, prosperity that we at our newspaper are going to try to uh, engage in and be a significant player in Tulsa. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> and please join me in thanking Connor Doyle and Jack Schaefer for joining us today. Well, this is, uh, brings us to the close of our program. But I did want to share with you, the clinic and the other programs uh, at the law school are committed to academic excellence. We continue to challenge our students with a rigorous curriculum here and our faculty intends to push them to be the strongest academically prepared students they can be to enter the profession. We also want to have them to be exposed experientially to those things that can help them grow. And this clinic and our other clinics are about accomplishing that. 
appreciate uh, your attendance here. Uh, I want to thank John for his time. I want to thank Karen for making the trip to Tulsa. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, and we, we look forward to additional conversations. The clinic often invites members of the community to talk and to exchange ideas with our students. And so the needs assessment goes on. Uh, you'll be interested to know that it is, I think, strongly possible what we are going to do in the future is that the clinic will have a small business development wing to it. That is, in other words, that we are going to continue to do the things that we do in family law and criminal law, but we also try to empower folks who have an interest in creating a business. How do you develop an LLC or a limited partnership? We want to put those pieces in place as well so that those per persons in North Tulsa or other parts of Tulsa can get legal advice on how best to do that so that they can continue to uh, achieve their own dreams. And so uh, to our president, we thank you for your support. Uh, to the faculty, thank you for being here. And for the members of the community, uh, our alums, the lawyers, um, we can't thank you enough. And we ask you to, to walk beside us, to be with us, because there's much work to be done, and we're about doing it. So thank you very much. Please feel free to come up and meet our guests and hang around the law school. It's a great day, and we're glad to have you here.